it's not quite easy to start after such tense um, presentations. And so I thought, what am I going to do? Well, the one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to speak on behalf of Greenpeace. I'm going to just talk about myself. Although I do dedicate this speech to my team at Greenpeace, the climate and justice team at Greenpeace. And um, I thought when I've been invited to this evening, how do I tell and summarize my experiences in a good way? Um, I came up with the idea of telling you a tale. This is why the chair is there. I don't know what your experiences is with tales, but they have to be told from chairs. And they have to be read from big books, which suits me fine, so I didn't have to memorize my short tale. I will tell you a tale of a man, let's call him the chap, and it's going to be an eight, about eight minute tale. The glasses have to go like this, so I can see you and I can read as old men, storytellers do. Once upon a time, there was a man. We'll call him our chap. Our chap was increasingly discontent with the way some people, a few, but very powerful people, let's call them the big polluters, are destroying the earth. He was very upset to see the suffering those big polluters caused to humans, animals, and nature at a very massive scale. So he decided to knock their doors and ask the big polluters, why are you engaging in mass damage and destruction of the earth? After a while, he realized he was actually not knocking doors. He was locking, knocking walls. Obviously without much luck, as the big polluters would not even hear him. But he was not about to give up when a fairy appeared, asking him, why are you banging against walls? So our chap explained to the fairy that he wanted to ask the big polluters why they're engaging in mass damage and destruction of the earth. Well, the fairy said, if you want them to listen to you, you must meet them at eye level. Well, how do I meet them at eye level? I'm not one of them, our chap asked. Oh, you must make it into their castle. When you make it there, they will look at you as one of them. Touched by his determination and also concerned about the state of the earth, the fairy decided to help him. She gave him a magic batch. What is this? Our chap asked. Well, this is the entry into the castle of the big polluters. And when you are there, they will treat you as one of their kind. The fairy responded. But where do I find their castle? Well, go in bleak midwinter to the land of wealth. Heidi land, it's called. Go to the high mountains, and that is where you'll find their winter castle. But remember, without that batch, you will not get in, she reminded him. But before she left, she told him a secret. Remember this, when you are in the castle, the big polluters see you as one of their kind. You can ask them any question, and they are bound to tell the truth. So when bleak within winter came, our chap made it into the high mountains in the land of wealth. And he did find their castle, their winter castle. Confident of having found the castle and being able to enter using the magic batch, he approached the first big polluter and asked him, why are you engaging in mass damage and destruction of the earth? Is the earth not dear to you? The first big polluter answered, well, the earth is very dear to us. This is why we put price tags on all of the earth just about every part of it. Without price, the earth would have no value. So we put price tag on the earth and everything, and then we buy and sell. The chap responded, 
but can't you see that you're inflicting suffering on nature and all of us? Can't you just stop the destruction? The big polluter answered, well, it is a costly game. If we were to cover the damage we cause, and we've heard that there is plenty of damage, we could no longer afford engaging in, it in mass damage and destruction, as the true costs would be far too high even for us. Thank God nobody asks us to cover the damage we cause. Anyhow, this is a game and the rules are not for us to decide. And he left. Our chap met pick big polluter number two and asked him again the same question. Why are you engaging in mass damage and destruction of the earth? Is the earth not dear to you? Big polluter number two responded, well, if we don't do it, someone else will. So it is better than we, that we do it. The chap responded, but can't you see that you're inflicting great suffering on nature and all of us? Can't you just stop destruction? The response was, only if all of us big polluters would be called to stop destroying, we would stop. That would create a, level playing, a leveled playing field where no one could engage in mass damage and destruction of the earth. But this is not for us to decide, he said and left. Our chap mate, big polluter number three, asked him the same question. The response was, well, it is not illegal destroying the earth. If it were such a big deal as you make it, then why is it not a crime? Surely, if it was so bad, there would be a law against it. We have laws against just about everything from homicide to genocide. The chap responded, but can't you see that you're inflicting great suffering on nature and all of us can't you just stop? Big polluter number three response wa was by walking off. Well, I guess if ecocide was made a crime, I guess then we would have to stop. But this is not for us to decide. He, our chap decided to seek those who could decide because he realized he's actually not getting any further with the big polluters, even now that they're listening to him. He figured this to be the ones to decide to be the leaders of the world. Let's call them the head of nations. And of course, the fairy had him a magic batch for such place to visit the head of states. As the fairy was supporting our chap's mission, same rules applied with the batch you can get in, you are considered one of them, and they will speak truthfully. Upon entry, he hold he told the first supposed leader about having met big polluters and why they were engaging in mass damage and destruction of the earth and that they were not about to stop unless someone would decide that they have to. The first supposed leader said, well, we cannot ask them to stop because we would lose jobs. Many of them, dirty jobs, unhealthy work, cheap labor, but jobs. Of course, if they stop, we could use the money to create healthy and decent paid jobs. We could, for example, invest in renewable energy instead of subsidizing fossil fuels. But people want first and foremost jobs, so I guess it's for them to decide. The first supposed leader walked off. Frustrate Frustrated, our chap stood there. Well, great. But he remembered something strange. He saw that, the, that they were very fine strings, almost invisible, were attached to the tongue, the head, the heart, and every bodily part of the supposed leaders. Strange, he thought. The second supposed leader said, well, we must get as much out of mass damage and destruction as possible before someone else benefits. This is wealth to us. The damage happened somewhere else. 
the consequences will be paid by future generations. But this is an exhausting race and very destructive. Where eventually we all do pay the price and it does ruin our reputation. And we are seen as greedy, careless nations running the world into the grounds. Sometimes I do wish we could stop this race. But my people want wealth at all costs. Upon leaving, our chap realized again those fine strings. And he decided to look where these strings would lead up to meeting the third supposed leader. The third supposed leader said, well, well, there is no law prohibiting mass damage and destruction of the earth. Our economy is based on ecocide. God forbid if this would become a crime. What then, our chap asked, remembering that the supposed leader would have to be truthful. We could no longer go for cheap, non-renewable sources and destroy the earth. But we would have to build a new sustainable economy, where people are less dependent on big companies, but small and medium-sized companies would create good and healthy jobs. An economy based on values where less is more, quality is more valued than quantity. While our chap was listening to what the third supposed leader said, he followed the very fine strings that were attached to the tongue, the head, the heart, and all bodily parts of the head of state. They were leading up into the clouds. But in those clouds, he could see the grimace of the big polluters. On those, but in those clouds, on those strings, making the leaders move and talk. In that moment, our chap realized he was not meeting with real leaders, but with puppets on strings, with the big polluters being the puppets' masters. No wonder they just talk alike, our chap concluded. Frustrated realizing that the leaders wouldn't lead, he said, but there must be someone willing to protect the earth. Of course there is. He heard the familiar voice of the fairy speaking to him. You just looked in all the wrong places. Where there is no common sense, it's useless to look for it. Don't seek wisdom where there is none, where there is no courage, you'll never find it. I invite you to a celebration, the fairy said. Another batch, more talking, not leading. Our chap was about to decline, being quite fed up with all these high-profile gatherings of self-pleasing men. What celebration? By whom? What is there to be celebrated, he asked. The fairy was amused. No batch required. It is a celebration of human courage. Courage of ordinary people. Where everyone is welcomed, who brings courage, the courage to stand up for what is right and against what is wrong. That got our chap curious. In this case, it's a celebration of human courage Courageous, in, courageous individuals holding big polluters accountable for the mass damage and destruction they are causing. But, but we cannot, our chap counted frustrated. There is no law holding big polluters accountable for ecocide on global level. Not yet. However, there sure is some good law. These people have found some good laws and now take legal actions. And maybe there are people amongst them that are engaging to put ecocide law as fifth crime against peace and help you to establish that. 
the fairy reminded him and twinkled. So our chap joined that celebration. And guess what? Not only did he find true leaders willing to listen and engage in the idea of a universal law to prohibit ecocide, but he loved the idea of using existing law so much whilst engaging in creating new law that he joined the ordinary people's victory and became part of their tribe. Because he suddenly understood where the power lies and that when people lead, sometimes leader follow. So they started suing the big polluters happily ever after while drawing up the first universal law ever coming from the people themselves. <laughs>